Okay, good. Hi, everybody, and uh, welcome to the provider panel here at ACG Chicago. Uh, my name's Eric Hargan. I'm a shareholder at Greenberg Trorick uh, here in Chicago. Uh, I'm in the healthcare practice at Greenberg, split my time between uh, representing investors and companies in the space, um, and uh, came back to private practice from a number of years at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services in D.C. Held a number of posts under the uh, Bush administration, um, Deputy General Counsel, Chief Regulatory Officer, and then finally Deputy Secretary over the department. And uh, in spite of that, I'm, I'm going to maintain my, uh, my political demeanor. Um, sure. <laughs> you've heard a lot of, uh, you heard a lot of uh, discussions about the ACA, obviously, this morning, but uh, we're really here mostly to talk about uh, the business environment surrounding providers and healthcare. And a lot of that is going to be driven by what happens with the ACA, whether it's overturned in June or limited or what have you. But um, nevertheless, I think we're going to be discussing here a little bit more of trends that are happening within the M&A world and some of the impacts that are happening either from the ACA or other trends that happen no matter what, because there are a lot of trends that are sort of inevitable, regardless of what happens in the political landscape this November and regardless of what the Supreme Court uh, decides. There are a lot of inevitable changes that I think are coming to the healthcare space, particularly in the reimbursement heavy provider space. So um, I think we can uh, provide some enlightenment regardless of really what happens in the upcoming months, uh, either legally in the Supreme Court or politically speaking in the November elections. Uh, First, I would like to introduce you to the to our panelists uh, today. We have here Lonnie, immediately to my left, Lonnie Busby, who is the CEO of Medsurant, uh, which is uh, works in a number of states: Oklahoma, Arizona, Tennessee, Texas, Colorado, and Georgia. Does is very busy with acquisitions in the space of neuromonitoring, um, which is uh, an interesting area, and uh, he'll have a lot to say about uh, the things that he's seen. Uh, immediately to his left is Kent Caps, who is a director at Surgical Care Affiliates, uh, which has 145 uh, ASCs and about a billion dollars of network revenue. And over there at the end of the panel is Jeff Huffman, the VP of Development at Alec Management Corp., which has 22 skilled nursing facilities throughout the Midwest, Illinois, Iowa, Wisconsin, and Indiana. So. We have a lot of different ranges uh, within the industry, within the provider space, uh, ranging from, as I said, ASCs, long-term care, and neuromonitoring. So we've got a lot of different perspectives to provide here. Um, and I think we're going to start with something pretty general, uh, things that we had discussed before, which are what trends everyone sees happening within the space, particularly related to their own experience um, that they've had in the last year or two as the provider space keeps changing under the impact of reimbursement and legal matters and uh, the general environment. So, uh, Lonnie? Oh, thank you. Um, <clears throat> just by way of background, uh, I am in the uh, intraoperative neuromonitoring business, uh, but I've spent 30 years managing hospitals uh, around the country, uh, was part of the startup team for Columbia Hospital Corporation back in 1988 and was the division president for uh, HCA uh, most recently. Um, then we had an opportunity to, uh, uh, to enter a new space, which new for me, uh, interestingly enough. I ran hospitals for 30 years and didn't realize that there is a, a little business that's taking place in the uh, operating room uh, and, and particularly for complex uh, spine and brain surgeries where um, a team of, uh, of technicians are monitoring the nerve impulses from the brain, the spinal cord, and uh, the peripheral nervous system to ensure there's no nerve damage. Uh, so uh, we acquired a platform company uh, in 2009 and are now in that space. And it's a fragmented industry. Um, and I guess uh, uh, in terms of, of trends, um, it, you know, I think within the provider community, um, 
people are, uh, are, you know, moving more and more toward larger organizations. So for the uh, IOM companies, typically started by physicians uh, or, te or technicians, uh, typically very small. Uh, the largest uh, uh, company uh, does, you know, I don't know, 2,500 cases a month. Uh, there are probably about 40,000 cases performed nationally a month. Uh, so uh, nobody has a, a, a big share. However, what we see in this industry is a consolidation, and I, I think that um, um, generally you'll see that uh, both in the hospital industry. Uh, my experience managing hospitals, uh, uh, when I went to uh, move to Denver, Colorado, uh, where I now live, and, and ran uh, a division for HCA, at the time, there were 18 different hospital systems in the, in the community. Now there are three. Uh, so that, that's the consolidation I think you see. Yeah. Thank you, Lonnie. So uh, by way of introduction, I am uh, Ken Capps, Director of Strategy for uh, Surgical Care Affiliates. As uh, Eric said, we have 145 ASCs in 30 states across the country, about a billion dollars in, um, in system-wide revenue. Uh, and uh, about 30 large health system partners. Uh, my role, uh, by the way, background, I, I, my background is in more in M&A. My role at Surgical Care Affiliates is really looking at new lines of business. Um, we were spun out of uh, health, the Health South Corporation in 2007, and, and we are a TPG portfolio company. So obviously, uh, TPG is looking for, at some point, um, an opportunity to monetize the investment. Um, and so we're looking to continue to grow our business. And what we've seen and, and where we're looking to grow is as the environment for ASCs and the regulatory environment has continued to get more uh, uh, complicated, uh, we have found that our best path to growth is we are looking to partner more closely with large health systems uh, with the idea that, hey, look, uh, you guys know hospitals, but we know ASCs. Let us help you manage the ASCs uh, and grow the ASC relationships. So ultimately, if we believe that the ACA is going to pass and we're going to move from an environment of fee-for-service to more of an accountable care type organization, um, we will be able to provide you a high-quality service at, at low cost. And you guys, as we partner with you, you can move your cases out of your HOPDs and into the ASC environment. Because ultimately, if you believe in a ACOs, you, you believe in the idea that uh, the world of fee-for-service, where it was about uh, utilization and uh, increasing market share, uh, that, that's going away. And, and what we think is, is the view now is this is going to be about qual high quality care at the lowest price. And we feel like we, we provide that um, better than anyone. And so that's really what we're, where we're looking to grow and then continuing to leverage these relationships with the large health systems into other community-based service offerings. Um, so we continue to see, we, we continue to believe uh, in the world of consolidation and we feel like we're in a good, good position to, uh, to benefit from that. Thanks, Ken. I'm, I'm Jeff Huffman. I'm from the Indianapolis, Indiana area. Uh, Ide Management owns and operates 22 long-term care facilities in four states. Um, hopefully uh, in the next couple months, that'll be closer to 30. Um, as we're looking at what's going on currently in uh, health care reform and in the market as a, as a great growth opportunity for our organization. The reason we think that is that uh, as long-term care facilities have always have to be relevant to the hospitals, we have to be more relevant than we've ever been. Uh, as we see the line of bundled payments um, and rehospitalizations and things move further and further down the pike to become reality. Um, we see a future in long-term care where folks are more of extremely strong regional players in that 50 to 80, maybe tops 100 buildings uh, in a concentrated region. I think you, if you pay any attention to the large public companies that are in long-term care out there, you see that's exactly what they're trying to figure out how to do. As an example, Kindred, Kindred is jettisoning, jettisoning um, what, 72 buildings um, over the next uh, 15 months to try to get to that more regional footprint in the areas that they're looking at. Um, one of the largest uh, organizations of about 300 building, 380 buildings in the country is up for sale. 
Um, we're seeing transaction prices quickly escalate um, in long-term care from, uh, you know, so, some of the things on the low end in 25 to $30,000 per bed um, to uh, a national average of 48. And I'm hearing rumors as of yesterday, a transaction may have uh, gotten inked in Indiana at $78,000 a bed. Um, so there's some, some interesting maneuvering going on in long-term care. Um, and, and we're going to continue to move forward with what we're doing. We believe that uh, there's, there's a couple niche markets in long-term care that have been ignored. I think uh, as with hospitals, where they have gone all of a sudden become the nicest buildings in the communities at a million to a million two uh, per bed at the cost of some of these new hospitals that are being built. Uh, Long-term care has followed suit, and there's a lot of folks out there building extremely high-end CCRCs, extremely high-end buildings that are geared toward the Medicare reimbursement. Um, when that comes into a bundled payment, uh, if your pro forma is based on that Medicare reimbursement and the hospital takes their cut uh, off the top, I'm not sure what that pro forma looks like afterwards. Uh, we've decided to go uh, kind of take what I refer to as a Chevrolet approach, uh, a high quality uh, outcome provider uh, without a, uh, uh, a top of the line um, over the top uh, building. Um, we'll have the same amenities, the same uh, the same spaces, but we won't have all the fancy rock and brick and uh, uh, Muzak and uh, and some of those things. Uh, we're going to be more the Chevy model of what we're doing. Uh, we're also looking at an interesting opportunity coming up where uh, we may be working hand in hand with a large physician's practice where um, to reduce rehospitalizations, we're going to actually have a, a physician's group that supplies us with our medical directors who will actually be in our buildings doing rounds every single day. Um, so there's some very unique opportunities that health care reform is bringing down the pike uh, that we see in long-term care. I think you're going to see the uh, mergers and acquisitions market increase relatively dramatically uh, nationwide, um, and I think you're going to see fewer and fewer operators um, that are that are going to be able to manage that space. And the, the, very honestly, in long-term care, the mom and pops uh, are probably going to disappear quicker and quicker, even though they've been disappearing over the years. And uh, um, it's been interesting with some of the reimbursement changes that we've seen in Indiana, uh, how many out-of-state providers we've seen show up in the state of Indiana, and very honestly, um, how many capital folks have all of a sudden figured out what's going on in Indiana and have showed up on the door. We didn't see you guys for a couple years. I have to check outside my door every day to see if there's a line. So uh, welcome back. <laughs> <laughs> so I've um, heard a little bit about the ACOs or the accountable care organizations that were that have been sort of being touted. Uh, in DC and are sort of being integrated, particularly hospital oriented ACOs uh, are becoming sort of a larger and larger topic. But it seems like, um, at least many have said that the ACO model is really limited, that it's going to become something more like the old PHOs and that like all the other attempts to coordinate care over the last few decades, it's going to again be a lot of fanfare and not a lot of follow through that there's going to be, that this is going to take its place as a sort of one model, but that it's not going to really be the revolutionary uh, idea that it was originally touted to be. Now, that being said, the government is always looking to, and this is from my own experience, the government's always looking to reduce the number of payers that it has to pay. It always wants to get a single unitary payer and then have them interact directly with CMS or whichever part of the government and then leave the distribution of the money to that single uh, recipient of payment. That's a long-term trend that the government's always trying to encourage. So that does lead to a lot of consolidation, as all of you have mentioned, about consolidation in the area. Now, that being said, when we talk about consolidation, what is the competition for acquisitions in the space that you're in? Um, who's in the market now? Are we, you seeing more strategic buyers, more financial buyers in the area? Any particular trends in that, in that area? And, and how important is M&A expertise and integration in your, in your sector? Well, I think um, in, in our sector, um, I think things were, uh, have been relatively quiet uh, for, this is a relatively new uh, in, industry, I'll call it an industry, um, uh, it's about a billion dollar uh, market uh, nationally, but um, it's been relatively quiet. As I mentioned, it's a very fragmented industry with hundreds uh, of companies that are in the business. Uh, but recently, 
Um, and maybe it's because, you know, we've attracted some attention uh, by uh, acquiring uh, five companies uh, in the last year. So uh, that, that, you know, probably has heated it up a little bit. Uh, so we're seeing some of the larger companies uh, take on uh, more and more acquisitions. And it's, it's really, um, I think, not driven by financial uh, buyers, but uh, strategic buyers. Uh, we have a strategy uh, for MedSure and Holdings to build scale in regional markets. And we don't want to have a, uh, an IOM outpost in, in 50 states. Uh, just for the sake of showing that we're a national player. What I'd rather have is uh, to be the dominant provider in the state of Texas or in Colorado or Tennessee. And uh, I think that's, uh, that drives our acquisition strategy. Uh, and it probably drives the strategy for some of our competitors as well. So within the ASC market, what we've seen over the last few years is a number of companies that um, were publicly traded have, have gone private um, and have been purchased by uh, financial sponsors. Um, so the majority of the companies uh, that have you know, considerable geographic scale are typically uh, backed by financial sponsors uh, like us. Uh, with respect to how we're looking to build out going forward is we're really, like Lonnie, we're looking to get density around our uh, major health system partners um, and using those relationships to go out and, and uh, consolidate um, uh, the centers, the ASCs that are owned by physician partners. So that's really what, where we're looking. We, we don't really see currently, um, uh, you know, there's really not any, any large strategics that, that we're currently uh, uh, competing against. In our space, um, I think the M&A market's always been relatively interesting. We see um, folks that we consider um, not necessarily in the long-term care world or long-term care operators appear and disappear um, in the space, and uh, we're seeing them reappear uh, currently. And when I say that, the institutional markets and, uh, and some, a lot of real estate folks uh, are now coming back in and looking at the uh, the long-term care market once again, uh, which is going to heat things up and, and probably increase prices. But, uh, you know, there's some very strong competition um, for acquisitions uh, in long-term care, but there's also uh, a pretty large supply uh, based on some of, uh, again, what the national chains are doing. So it's going to be interesting to see how that all works out. Um, again, we're going to continue to have to work um, with the uh, with the ACO model and, and be relevant to the hospitals, uh, I can tell you that our standpoint is we pl don't plan to be any kind any kind of a nationwide provider. We plan on being a extremely strong, high quality driven Midwest provider um, in four to five to six states, most at, at a capacity of 80 to 100 buildings. So uh, that's the the long term strategy for us. And I know that there's going to be a lot of competition that's going to enter the market uh, for that as we all continue to work together, um, as you see with hospitals acquiring doctors' practices and hospital long-term care relationships uh, that, have, that have been created are all in, in ways to increase quality and maximize reimbursement. So, Jeff, to sort of key off of that, do you see that small providers are looking to be acquired? Yes. Um, if so, why? Why do you think? Uh, economies of scale. Um, as I mean, as an example, um, at the, the the average building, as an example, in Indiana that doesn't have economies of scale saw a 5% uh, cut in their Medicaid rate um, and anywhere from an 11 to 18% cut uh, on their Medicare rate, depending upon what they were kind of rugs they were running with their therapy in their Medicare rehab uh, area in their building. So why everybody runs, runs around talking about 11% Medicare cut, that thing, that thing varied from 11% to almost 18.5%. Uh, depending upon what kind of rugs you were running in your therapy department inside your building. So um, when you take a hit like that and what you do, what um, our governor, um, somewhat um, interesting hero around the country, Mitch Daniels, did, um, was implement a 5% Medicaid cut uh, in July, July 1, but uh, with his ongoing battle with CMS, 
um, still hasn't got that state plan amendment approved, so they implemented that 5% cut retroactively back to July 1st on January 1. So there was a lot of folks that all of a sudden had the state reach into their bank account and yank a whole bunch of money, uh, and then also uh, stop paying for about uh, five weeks. So I, I was in Indiana kind of feeling like I was back in Illinois again for a while. Um, <laughs> there, was, there was no money flowing. Um, so it, it makes it challenging for someone who doesn't have those economies of scale either um, by the size of their operation and the number of buildings or that geographic location where they're able to balance some of those state changes by having operations in three or four states. Yeah, I would agree. Uh, I, I would agree that um, uh, the smaller operators are, are having a tough time competing with more efficient uh, operators. Um, as, as we continue to grow in, in size, uh, we started uh, as a small company doing 100 surgical cases a month. We're now doing, you know, 1,500 uh, cases a month. And that enables us to uh, reduce the cost of some of the, uh, the back office functions, the accounting and, and finance and billing and collection and IT. All of those things uh, enable us to reduce the cost per case uh, which helps us negotiate better rates with payers. Um, the other thing that's, uh, that kind of drives uh, acquisitions in our particular um, field is the changes in the Stark Law uh, that prohibits uh, self-referral self for physician owners. And this business, this industry, uh, was developed uh, in large part by physician owners who uh, surgeons who needed uh, monitoring for their cases, so they hired a, a monitoring technician and, uh, and a reading physician and started their own company. Um, they can't do that any longer. They can't refer to themselves, to, to a company that they own and still do the surgery. So they're, they're, it's forcing them to, 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 to get out. And so we find that uh, we're, uh, so, uh, owners are very receptive uh, when we come calling uh, for that reason. We've seen a considerable amount of consolidation um, in, in the ASC industry, and a lot of that has to do with the fact that health systems have been uh, buying uh, uh, primary care physician practices and have been referring those cases into uh, their hospitals. And if you don't have that referral base, uh, we think long term it's going to be um, detrimental to the ASCs that don't have that relationship. And so we feel like the fact that we have these relationships gives us, gives us a leg up on some of these other ASCs that, that don't have those, those relationships. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, something that you had all brought up is this drive for lowering costs. Uh, in some cases, it's pretty extreme. And I'll say from governmental point of view, when we were making up the payment regs every year, um, I was part of that process, um, being in charge of regulations. The, you know, that's always, there's an, always a drive to lower costs, at least until a bunch of providers in a sector start going bankrupt. Believe it or not, that's one of the signals. Uh, so the government's very careful, in case you can't tell. They look for bankruptcies. Uh, that's how they can tell whether they've got the price right. Uh, they start seeing bankruptcies in a sector. So it's a very, very delicate mechanism. Um, so anyway, the, they're always looking for lowering costs, but of course the, the immediate response to that is if you lower costs, you lower quality. Uh, so the government has responded to that by a lot of quality initiatives, and now that they've got the ability to handle the information well through all the reporting uh, programs that have been going on at the hospital and physician level for the past few years, they feel really comfortable putting out quality demands onto providers. So it seems obvious, but they say we want lower cost and we want higher quality. So it's created kind of a pincher-like movement on providers. Just ask the panel, do you think it's possible to achieve higher quality and lower cost, really? Um, and if so, how is that constant demand sort of shaping the market that you're in, uh, in terms of pressure on providers? Well, um, I, I can speak uh, on behalf of hospitals, since I've managed hospitals for 30 years, uh, but also uh, the, the current uh, business that I manage. Um, it's sad to say, um, from the hospital standpoint that there's a lot of uh, inefficiency uh, in our hospitals. Uh, so there's a, there's, there's a great opportunity to reduce the cost of care. Um, 
uh, fortunately, we also always have a drive for improving quality. Uh, so I've seen, you know, a lot of changes in reimbursement over the years, uh, and every 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 significant change in reimbursement brought, you know, cries of, oh, what are we going to do? I mean, we're going to, we, how how will we survive under this reimbursement, uh, this reduced reimbursement? You know what? We always survived, and we and and usually we made more money after the changes in reimbursement than we did before because we found new ways of of operating more efficiently. Uh, and I think that's, that's you're going to continue to see that. I'm not worried about, uh, about the hospitals. Again, you know, from a quality standpoint, uh, I would, I'm proud to say that hospitals really focus on, on improving quality constantly. In our business, uh, it's a great business because uh, when you use our service, it improves the quality of care because you, it, it prevents returns to surgery, uh, permanent nerve damage, uh, and as a result of that, it, it, it reduces the cost of care. So you couldn't find a better health care business than one that improves quality and reduces cost, uh, which is one reason we really like uh, the business we're in. So SCA has been at the forefront of developing um, quality metrics for the ASC market. We feel like we're already there with respect to offering a higher quality service, or a, 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 at a minimum, uh, the, the same level of quality as hospitals. Um, some would argue that we, we offer uh, better quality than hospitals. And we've already been forced by, uh, by our payers and, and CMS to provide that quality at about half the price of what um, CMS is reimbursing. Uh, HOPDs, so within the hospital, they're getting paid twice what we what we get paid, and so we've already been forced to provide that quality uh, at a, at a lower cost, and so we we feel like we're there. Um, it's obviously something that we continue to, to to strive to offer better quality, and it's it's always a challenge, but we feel like we we can compete head to head with with hospitals uh, today. My immediate answer to your question, Eric, was going to be no. Um, at least in, in our um, space. Um, one of the things that we struggle with in the long-term care side is um, w those of us that are knee-deep in the reimbursement system always joke and have for years that anything that coming out of the government that says quality improvement is really code for reimbursement cut. Um, and and you, usually uh, it is driven somewhat that direction. We're intrigued by the whole way that health care reform um, process moved forward. Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and be a little politically incorrect here. Um, in the health care space, I think hospitals spend the most money and maybe some of the most efficient operators in the health care space. I think they will admit that uh, if they have to be honest. I had an interesting conversation with the CEO of a hospital one time about an appendectomy. He says, I have no idea what it cost me, but I can tell you what I charge for it. Um, in the long-term care space, we can tell you exactly what every one, every one of our expenses is down to a cost per patient day. Um, and, you know, we, we see hospitals building $1.2 million per bed new hospitals. And with bundled payments, we, I hear everyone talk about the inefficiencies seem to, seem to exist uh, on the hospital level and some of the quality issues exist on the hospital level, but we've decided to bundle payments and give them to the hospitals. Uh, for them to then disperse out to all of their all of their uh, partners and providers, which I think is going to be interesting, um, because I think if you look outside of the hospital world to the healthcare space as a whole, um, those of us sitting at this table are probably the most efficient operators in that space, and I think more and more of this responsibility are going to come down on our shoulders. And I'm just not sure how that's going to work with the reimbursement system. Yeah. Uh, and you know, I can verify that when we were putting together hospital compare. <coughs> administration, we were trying to prepare a scorecard for the hospitals. So start out uh, down the line, and again, it's just there's a group of us talking about how to do it, and we first thought, what are we going to compare? So we compare uh, physical outcomes, meaning like, you know, morbidity, mortality, complications, so on, or should we compare the cost? Okay, we decided, well, you, you know, given physical systems and biology, we'll go with the cost. That's got to be easier. A year later, <laughs> a year later, we abandoned the attempt to try to compare it because it was actually impossible for us to decide, for us to find out from the hospitals how much procedures cost. Um, and we actually went the other route 
and started putting the stuff together based on uh, morbidity, mortality, complications, all those kinds of things. So physical outcomes actually turned out to be a lot easier for us to judge than economic outcomes, and that is based on the government's own pretty rich set of data that it gets from the hospitals on what's going on internally. So it was even with the government's access to information and the ability to kind of beat the hospitals until all the information is coughed up, we still couldn't figure it out. So that totally bears uh, in with what, you're, with what you're talking about in terms of hospitals and, and sort of the inability to kind of get down to the ground level on what things cost. Well, uh, one comment I would make to, to that, Eric, is there's a number of hospitals that I've worked with um, over the last few years where we've even just tried to figure out what the revenue was and the breakdown of the revenue by sort of uh, functions within the hospital. And because of the DRG codes, they were, they were unable to really say what even the revenue was, so not even a, to a cost basis. Okay. And, and just to add on, from a positive standpoint, most of the hospital organizations that we're working with today acknowledge that. Um, and are asking us to work closer and closer them, to them as a partnership so that um, we can take those patients out of the hospital sooner uh, and, and be able to uh, ultimately create better, uh, least ex less expensive quality outcomes than what they can currently do inside the hospital system. So it may end up being advantageous to us all. It just was interesting to me that all the money is being driven through the hospitals. Yeah. I mean, now this raises a question sort of, you know, a lot of what you all are talking about is really you know, what has come out of the hospital, right? Sort of what is, how is the role of the hospital changing? Uh, obviously, we've been talking about its role as sort of the conduit for the money coming from the various payers, but also how is their role changing in terms of as a, a coordinator of services, a provider of services, and, and their relationships with other providers from being the old classic general hospital of your, um, that sort of has everything inside it to sort of a different, a completely different model. Is it changing from your point of view? Well, um, hospitals tend to, um, to to respond to changes in reimbursement um, uh, and do crazy things. So uh, I, I remember when we were faced with Hillary Care, which which, geez, it seems a lot like the Accountable Care organizations. Um, what did hospitals do? They rushed out and started buying physician practices uh, because they wanted, and, and primary care physicians, uh, because they wanted the first dam on the river. You know, uh, primary care physicians were going to control the flow of patients, so the hospitals had to own them. So they bought these physician practices and, and uh, immediately began to lose about a million dollars a year per position, um, which didn't help at all. Uh, and then Hillary Care never never came to be. Uh, we're seeing the same thing today. I mean, I'm, we're seeing hospitals acquiring uh, physician practices again uh, with the same, uh, you know, crazy economics uh, uh, as the first time they, they bought them. You, know, you, you, you buy a physician and all of a sudden they, uh, their whole incentives change. Now they're on a salary and, gee, I, they don't want to work so hard. Uh, so uh, productivity immediately drops, and you begin to lose money on those on those positions. Now they're buying specialists um, instead of just primary care physicians, uh, which is crazy. Um, but that's you know, uh, hospitals will um, as the the dominant uh, economic entity in the healthcare system in any market are going to drive uh, every everything else. Okay, so uh, they even drive, they'll even drive what ha what's happening with um, uh, skilled nursing facilities, with ambulatory surgery centers, um, even our little business um, will be affected by what hospitals do or don't do. Um, so we've seen it uh, very widely. Uh, some of the health systems and hospitals that we've partnered with are on the forefront, really thinking um, through. Uh, thoughtfully of, of how they can survive in, in this new um, new world. Others are, are less um, forward-looking and, and are really um, not fully thinking through the implications. And so we, we've seen, like, like I said, it's, it, it varies widely, um, but, uh, but we think it's definitely we need to be partnered with, with the health systems. 
I mean, again, from our standpoint, um, it, it's going to be interesting. Um, we've, you know, all of these acquisitions that, that I just heard talked about by hospitals of, of, of physician groups and everything else, um, and it, believe it or not, it, some people, if they didn't know what was going, would, going on, would look at Indiana and think that hospitals have purchased a whole bunch of nursing homes in Indiana, which is kind of true, sort of, not really, um, because all these things are driven by reimbursement. Um, a lot of those physician practices that have been acquired were acquired because the physician as an employee of the hospital could bill more for the same practice or the same procedure than they could as an independent doc. Um, fact. Um, the same reason you're seeing some of these partnerships between hospitals and, and long-term care facilities. It's a, it's, a re it's a reimbursement mechanism, and if that reimbursement <laughs> mechanism goes away, guess what? Those partnerships immediately go away. Um, so uh, it, it's just a really interesting time right now to see how everybody works together, how everybody figures out how to do it. And very honestly, uh, one thing we don't spend enough time talking about um, when we talk about reimbursement and quality and mergers and acquisitions is making sure that the patients in our buildings are getting well taken care of. Just, just to uh, echo what Jeff said, certainly one of the, one of the things that we've seen is that um, reimbursement lift as uh, as a provider moves into the hospital uh, uh, world we think that that's in a short-term um, sort of uh, benefit long term that's definitely going to go away as you see the, the move to ACOs and so anyone that's that's buying those PCPs for uh, for the rate lift we think are, are in the long run are going to be going to be punished by that Why? I mean, is it, is it more for the reasons of what we just heard about, which is that we've been here before, 20 years ago, right? Which is that the hospitals bring the physicians in-house, uh, they find out that the physician's incentives change, and then they spin them all right back out five years later, 10 years later, and then now we're seeing them spin back in. What, what do you, why do you think uh, specialists are particularly problematic? Well, um, first of all, they cost more, and... Um, um, I have a friend who runs a, a, a small hospital in Mississippi. Um, he inherited a couple of cardiovascular surgeons uh, that the hospital is paying $750,000 a year for these two uh, heart surgeons in a small community. Uh, and they do, you know, 50 open heart surgeries a year. Why, why on earth would you waste hospital resources providing a service that, number one, is not needed, and number two, is dangerous because if you're only doing, you know, 50 heart surgeries a year, uh, you probably shouldn't even be trying. Uh, it takes, you know, surgery is one of those things where uh, the more you do, the better you are. Um, and so a, a good uh, heart hospital is doing at least 250 to, to 400 cases a year uh, just to keep the the heart team, you know, in, in, in practice. Um, so that's one of the reasons. I, I, I think it's just, um, as I've said, that hospitals do, do crazy things, and it sort of becomes a, um, a competitive thing. So if, if the hospital down the street buys a, a, a cardiovascular surgeon, then I'm going to have to buy one uh, to, to, to compete with them. That's crazy. But, you know, part of it is also trying to keep patients in place, right? The hospitals work to keep their patients in place. They're really locally oriented in many cases. And, you know, you hear that all the time, that all health care is local. You know, it's a service business. It's local. A lot of the patients like to stay with their current with their current doctors. So do you think, you know, given that this, and people say this, and push back if you, you know, just could put this out there, I mean, you have always heard all health care is local. Do you think that all health care is local? Do you think that that sort of concentration in or dominance of a local market is important? Or do you think that now with increasing access by patients to information on their providers, that patients are becoming pickier, more inclined to change their affiliation with a doctor or a provider of some sort? Um, or do you see those those lines continuing? In other words, is it do you, when you're looking at someone, do you pay attention to 
dominance in the local market, or do you think that that's changing in healthcare? No, I think um, I think I, I agree with uh, the statement that healthcare is a local business, um, and in, in part of our strategy is when we acquire companies, we don't change the name of the company. We we keep the local brand because healthcare is a local business. The surgeons who use that service, um, assuming it's been providing good quality service, th they don't care uh, for another brand. I mean, they just they, they know what they've got, and that's what they want to keep. Um, uh, back in the uh, in the days when we were building uh, the bi the big healthcare company, Columbia HCA, um, Rick Scott had a strategy of uh, we want to be the Walmart of uh, Walmart of healthcare. And that, that meant, you know, a hospital on every corner, and, and we would contract with, on a national basis with payers, and we'd be the most efficient. It never worked, I mean, because the, the buyers are local. You know, the, the, the self-insured employers in the, the local market, they're not buying from a big company. They're buying from the local hospital. And so uh, from an HCA standpoint, we didn't rebrand every hospital in the uh, we had 350 hospitals at one time. We didn't rebrand them all. Uh, we kept the local name uh, because that's the reputation that's built around that local hospital. It's not, God forbid, you know, it's, uh, uh, things happened with HCA that, that could have tarnished the reputation of every one of those hospitals had they um, changed their names, and now they were the, the HCA hospital of, uh, of uh, the community. We, I would agree that healthcare is is local, and definitely we see value in partnering with the dominant players in a, in a given market. Typically, we want to partner with either the number one or number two player with respect to market share in a given market, and we can we think that that'll continue to to play out. I think it's a bit of both. Um, I think that we're going to see, uh, at least from our uh, part of the healthcare system, more of a regional play. Um, and but with that said, um, all of our all of our activities at the building level um, are all local. We have to at my level have to partner with hospitals and physicians groups to make the things happen on a regional level that we need, need to make happen. But when we go into a new community and acquire a building, the first thing I try to do is go steal the biggest and the best hometown administrator in the community. Um, because I want everybody to know who that building is. And uh, I tease my administrators uh, that if you're not like me, if you're not getting four or five phone calls at this point in time from friends our age saying, I've got to put mom, dad, or grandma and grandpa into a building, can you help me? Um, not enough people know what you do for a living. Um, so it, it's a combination of very much local uh, from a customer service standpoint and, and taking care of those folks so that they continue to come to you and continue your customer base. But from a regulatory and reimbursement issue, it's very much become, become regional. Okay. Interesting. Um, okay, well, those are my questions, but I want to make sure that you all get a chance to ask questions now before this uh, session ends. So uh, if anybody has a question for our esteemed panelists. Yep. Um, so we talked about, obviously, it's local, the purchasing power is local, but you've got consolidation happening in some, in some cases, national consolidation. We talked a little bit about back office efficiencies and other economies of scale, what, which are kind of typical of any business model, regardless of if it's healthcare or something else. What healthcare specific economies of scale do you guys bring or do your competitors bring um, that's different than accounting or purchasing? Negotiation. Those of you who may not have been able to hear that the question is: What healthcare-specific efficiencies or economies of scale uh, do you bring to the table above and beyond sort of accounting, negotiations with payers, uh, purchasing, that sort of thing that you think is is unique? And what are your competitors or your competitors? We believe that from a clinical standpoint, clinical quality, the fact that we have 145 centers. Um, and, and really a, a clinical excellence and a way that we deliver care that's different um, brings brings value since we've seen, you know, we have a lot of these programs that if you're smaller, you wouldn't be able to, to bring. We have management expertise and, and management tools um, and clinical quality tools that smaller players, you know, wouldn't be able to, 
ha have the knowledge or the time or the ability to put put together. And so we feel like there's extremely there's an incredible amount of value that that we bring to the table with with those tools. Yeah, I agree. Uh, you know, we we have uh, standard clinical protocols for how a surgery case is is handled, and what you know what every monitoring technician has to look for, uh, what they do at each step of the surgery. Uh, so so we are able to bring that that, that clinical quality uh, to any uh, businesses that we acquire. You know, we have a medical we have a, a medical director for the company who's who's been a leader in this industry for 30 years and has seen it all. Uh, and setting that clinical standards, I mean, our goal is to be the, not necessarily the biggest, but the best quality uh, operator in the business. And I think that's, in addition to the efficiencies that, that we're able to bring, uh, benchmarking is certainly an, another tool, um, uh, because the, the small business doesn't really know if they're operating efficiently. We can look across scale and say, you know, you, this company that, that we're acquiring is, is terribly inefficient. You know, they have too many people doing certain kinds of functions and not enough people doing others. Uh, so that's helpful. I, ours is a little bit interesting um, because I, for, if I were going to compare us to one of our competitors, I, I, I don't know that any of those efficiencies that you talked about would be much different from one long-term care company to the other. Our business model is a little bit different. Um, we tend to, uh, versus trying to go into the big, bigger metropolitan areas and, and fight it out with everybody that's already there, we tend to acquire um, rural underperforming buildings that need a lot of help uh, from a capital structure, from uh, a physical plant structure, and from a quality structure, and we come in and, uh, and drive that money into it um, and turn that operation around and not only become a, a key employer in the community, but sometimes turn an eyesore into uh, uh, a, a pretty nice operation and an employer for that, for that local community, and that's where we build our success uh, is coming and doing that, which is just a little bit different than one of a lot of, of our competitors. They would, they would walk by some buildings that um, Mark and I tend to sometimes buy buildings because we go into them and we get agitated by the way the building looks and uh, what we perceive as the, as the care that patients are getting that deserve better and those sometimes tend to be the buildings we buy. are currently being built at a million to two million dollars per bed. They don't know what the revenue is and how can they go forward with building um, and sort of how does that, how does, how does somebody justify that? Well, I would, uh, in defense of hospitals, I've, I've kind of been critical of them, but um, hospitals by and large do know what the revenue uh, is. Uh, what they don't have are cost accounting systems uh, to really drill down into, into the cost structure uh, to know uh, if I do uh, 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 a heart bypass procedure, what is, the, what is the actual cost of doing that? And how can I improve, uh, how can I lower that cost and improve the efficiency of those kinds of procedures? Um, I, I would bet that uh, Kent probably does know uh, what the cost of doing a, uh, that kind of procedure might be or a knee replacement or something uh, because they you know, just applied it uh, uh, as a for-profit company a lot more effectively than most of our hospitals are large non-profit hospitals, um, which I always say nobody, nobody has any money invested in them. Uh, there are no shareholders. It's just a community hospital. Um, and so nobody, nobody worries that much about the cost, un unfortunately. We would tell you that hospitals are focused on, traditionally have been focused on, uh, volume and market share. So they want to be bigger and they want to have more volume. And we think that that world is changing. It's going to be a world where you want higher quality outcomes uh, at lower prices. And it'll, it'll, it'll get to that. Um, I think that you're seeing, I think what we're seeing now is a discussion 10 years ago about how hospitals weren't focused on customer service. Um, and, and now you, that's what that's what you're seeing with uh, with some of these hospitals. But we'll uh, again, you know, we'll we'll work through it all. Uh, it'll end up 
shaking out in the end. Yeah. You know, I'm noticing here that we've kind of reached our natural stopping point uh, for this. Obviously, uh, you know, if you have more questions, uh, we'll, we'll be available here afterwards, but I don't want to keep people in place who have another uh, sort of place to go to after this. Yeah. On behalf so, of ACG Chicago, I'd like to extend our thanks to our panelists. We certainly appreciate you being here. You did a great job. Thanks. So uh, thank you very much. And please stand up. Thank you. Thank you.